Good morning, everyone. It's fantastic to be here. It's a great honor, great privilege. I couldn't have imagined a couple of years ago. I'm just grateful for this kind invitation from SRHE, from Helen. I'm grateful for the introduction from Paul. I'm happy to be here. I'll be talking about a rare scholarly theme, social certification in higher education, inside higher education, at a particular level, the level of individual academics, each of us. The academic profession is becoming massified. We know it. But the other thing which we don't always realize, also the academic profession is becoming massified. So the end result of this double massification process is that we academics are under detailed public scrutiny. We are under increased policy interest. That's new to us. There are more and more and more of us, not only students, but also as academics. Higher education in general, and by extension, the academic profession, are in the public spotlight today. The general assumption of the speech is that the stratification-related changes directly affecting the lives and work of academics are likely to intensify. I have studied these tensions for years. The research I'm reporting on, it took me about five years to complete and another couple of years to collect the data with international colleagues. So it's a long story which I'm trying to make short today. While international comparative research in general is focused on institutions and systems, my focus has additionally been on the micro level of individual academics. Empirical background to my theoretical concerns is as follows. More than 17,000 returned surveys from academics. More than 500 interviews across seven countries done by national teams. Finally, 11 European countries studied. This speech is about how academics are deeply stratified and sharply graded in detail, empirically, but also with a lot of policy implications. The empirical material use is large scale. It's mostly quantitative. It's international. But I believe this multi-country, multi-level research can possibly lead to valuable insights. We didn't have this chance a decade ago because no, because no data about the academic profession in so much detail was available, but it's available today. The background concepts in this speech are as follows. Competition among academics, but also among institutions. Vertical differentiation in higher education systems. And last but not least, the attractiveness of the academic profession and the attractiveness of the academic career. Research, as Paul said, is in the center of the speech. While it is not in the center of the whole higher education sector, it's in the center of only parts of it. Research in this speech is viewed as powerful academic game, of which we are not aware in all parts of the sector. Research in this speech is not inclusive. It's not democratic. It's not egalitarian. Even more, it's unrelated to the community engagement agenda. It's unrelated to the teaching mission. Research is viewed here as prestige-driven, ruthlessly, internationally competitive. But at the same time, it's at the heart of the academic recognition and reward system. And this is one of those moments in which inclusion and excellence comes together. Prestige-driven and at the heart of the recognition and reward systems across all European systems. Teaching is equally valued as a core university activity, but it's not the principal focus of a speech. It will be focused tomorrow and the day after tomorrow. So in higher education, there are students and their families, local communities and their needs, the social role of education, social mobility, social reproduction of elites, etc., etc. But also, on top of that, there is a day-to-day -day struggle for academic recognition on the way of, in, in the case of each of us, possibly attractive academic workplace, possibly successful academic career, 
And it's all, it's all on our fragile academic shoulders. We are experiencing mission overload, overburdening at the very individual level. We have to be doing everything and taking care of everything. And we have to live with that. The species structure is followed, as follows. The context, very briefly, three stratification types. And now, I'll say it now, academic performance stratification, academic salary stratification, and the international research certification, three major types. I'll discuss each type separately. I'll discuss policy implications of each type of social certification separately. And uh, I'll give you some conclusions. This research belongs to International Comparative Academic Profession Studies, or it can be, co can be called Sociology of Academic Careers. The context, very briefly, as you can already imagine, is massification of the academic profession, not of the higher education sector. There are huge numbers of students and they're accompanied by huge numbers of academics. Things which were possible before for academics are not possible today. The basic assumption of the speech is, and the critical dynamics is, as massification progresses, stratification follows. In Marginson's formulation related to institutions, I refer this formulation to the individuals. As massification progresses, stratification follows. European systems increasingly introduce vertical differentiation, expecting different contributions to knowledge, also and especially via published research, from academics representing different segments of the system. We are working in different subsectors for different purposes with slightly different reward systems, but as I will be explaining towards the end of the speech, we have to be unified, not so much divided. Differential access to opportunities in research, however, has far-reaching implications for academic careers. I would say for each of us. We have new teaching only, teaching mostly segments of the profession with new tasks, so the profession is changing across Europe, across the world. We are changing. And this is the context. Very briefly, the three times which I mentioned three types of social certification which I will explore today are as follows. Are, are as follows. Academic performance certification. We are divided by research output from high to low to none. We are divided by academic salary. We have academic salary certification, the second point. So we are divided by income from high to low. We are divided by international collaboration. Yes, I am collaborating internationally in research, no, I'm not. And I termed it international research, research certification. So there will be three types of social certification explored. And now the basic point is that social certification in higher education refers directly to academics, to their work and lives. And you can study it as long as you have empirical data at the individual level, which we do have at this moment. So, Social certification higher education can be operationalized, and I did it. It can be rigorously measured, and my colleagues across Europe did it, and compared cross-nationally. And the story is what you're seeing here today. Very briefly about the data and methods. Data come from two large comparative research projects, CAP and EuroAC. 11 European countries, as you can see, UK and Poland, the only non-Western European country included. The data were cleaned, weighted and integrated by the University of Kassel. Again, as I said, more than 17,000 returned surveys. 17,000 academics spent 45 minutes to one hour filling in these forms. It's unbelievable today. It's unbelievable. So we, we owe these academics a lot. A micro-level individual approach was used, so I'm using primary rather than secondary data voluntarily provided by academics in a consistent internationally comparable format. The unit of analysis is the individual academic. The subsample was used, not all academics, but only those teaching and research involved, 
only those full-time employed, only those from the university sector, and they were studied by my major clusters of academic fields and by country. I was seeking the characteristics of the free, comparatively internationally under-researched classes of academics, highly productive academics, and I told them research top performers of the upper 10% of academics across Europe, across clusters of academic fields in terms of productivity, research productivity. Then highly paid academics or academic top earners, the upper 20% in terms of academic income. And finally, highly internationalized academics whom I termed internationalists in research contrasted with locals in research who say, no, I'm not collaborating internationally in research with international colleagues. Yes or no, simple question, simple answer, also in the data set. So the simple questions which I was asking throughout my research over the years was who they are, how they work, what is their working time distribution, what is their academic role orientation, what they think about their work. These were the guiding questions. Now, first type of certification, academic performance certification. One of the most, impo one of the most important dividing lines in academia today, the first type. The class of top performers has not been explored in international comparative studies. We were studying them internationally or in single fields of knowledge. For instance, UK, US, for instance, psychology, education. There have been limited amount of comparative studies. My research shows the following. First, inherent undemocracy in relation to individual research performance. Huge, huge divisions. Second, the strongly skewed distribution of research productivity with a very long tail on the right, which I will show in the graph in a moment. Third, a huge number of low publishers accompanied by a very small number of high publishers across Europe, across clusters of academic fields. That's really surprising. Finally, top performers, the upper 10% in terms of productivity, in the 11 countries studied, are responsible for about a half of all academic knowledge production. Half of knowledge production across Europe, in terms of peer review articles, publications in English, internationally co-authored publications, whatever measure I was using, half of academic knowledge production comes from those defined by me as top performers or the upper 10%. Very briefly, you can see here um, the, the slides in which on the left you have top performers compared with the rest of academics. You see the difference in productivity, 400 to 700 percent. It's on the left. And on the right, you see the small percentage of authors with large number of papers across academic fields. So you can see this long tail on the right. You see huge numbers of academics with a few papers and very few of them with big number of papers. And it was did for every country, for every cluster in the data set. My analysis identified several common features of top performers. Common fe features, who they are, the question was. They are predominantly male, middle-aged, predominantly full professors, as we can imagine. Their research tends to be international in, international in scope orientation. They're, they collaborate more often both nationally and internationally. I would say both nationally and internationally. They publish abroad more often and they focus on basic and theoretical rather than applied research. That's important. Top performers focus on basic and theoretical research. They work longer total working hours and longer research hours. If you can imagine, for instance, in Germany, top performers work additional 43 full days per year, and Norwegian top performers work additional 46 days per year compared to the rest of academics. It's like another two months, eight hours per week, 40 hours a day, 40 hours per week. So, even more, in addition, top performers spend more time on teaching 
This is surprising. They spend more time on teaching. They spend more time on service and administration. In contrast to the expected teaching research trade-off, we, we would be expecting them to be teaching less and spending more time on research. But it's not the case. There's more, much more work in every aspect of academic work involved in the case of top performers. So across all the systems studied, they are also more research oriented, which is maybe clear. And this research orientation emerges in my research as a powerful indicator, indicator of top performer status. And at the same time, teaching orientation virtually excludes one from this class. You can show it by percentages in which country it's possible to have uh, leaning, towards, uh, leaning towards teaching and still be a, 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 a top performer. It's very, very difficult to, to achieve, statistically speaking. We are talking about thousands of academics, so there are huge exceptions, but statistically speaking. There are powerful implications for academic careers. I would say what to do and what not to do if one wants to have a successful research career. There are powerful implications of those findings. My findings confirm that academic knowledge production hinges on top performers, both nationally and internationally. They are highly homogeneous in terms of working patterns and role orientation, in terms of hours spent in many other respects. They are similar cross-nationally and differ substantially from other academics internationally. I would say they are different academic species. However, however, despite stratification, the systems of higher education are stable. They are still perceived as fair and meritocratic. The legitimacy of the system is not in question at the moment. The egalitarian ideology that binds scientists together protects the stratified scientific community as it is highly divided against polarization. So no matter what happens today across 11 systems, polarization is not there and this, this system is still legitimate. The second type of stratification which I, which I want to discuss is academic salary stratification. I have adopted a cross-national perspective to investigate predictors for entry to the class of top earners. It's not the upper 10%, it's the upper 20% because of the data limitations. So they were defined, top performers, as those in the 80th percentile of gross academic income, 40 plus in terms of age, so that we are not comparing different academic cohorts, with at least 10 years of academic experience in each of the five major academic clusters and in each country separately, so that we don't compare Polish economists only at the bottom of, 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 this, of this league with Swiss economists. We were, I was studying them by country and by academic cluster. So what the results show? They show that top earners are substantially more productive, 80 to 140 percent. They are publishing more internationally co-offered research, 100 to 150 percent, than compared with the rest of research involved academics. Surprisingly, however, while top earners work longer administrative service hours rather than longer research hours and shorter teaching hours, they are more academically productive. There is a big issue of time distribution and productivity, which somehow questions initial assumptions from the last 50 years of academic salary studies. You can see it here in the graph where it's not an issue of exact productivity data. The issue is about the patterns, patterns that matter. So on the left, you have peer-reviewed article equivalents, the average number, and on the right, you have internationally co-offered article equivalents. And if you look at the UK, which are the right bars, you see the difference. Top, before, top earners are much more productive. They are all older and they are all research involved. And they have, all of them have good, good research experience and academic experience. And still this is the difference. And I'm showing here only countries which are stati with, with statistically significant results. So there is something, there is something interesting in it. 
which I will discuss in a second. So my results show that statistically significant working time differential, differentials between top earners and the rest of academics do not emerge for teaching and research time, time investments. It's fascinating because traditionally we knew more time spent on research, higher productivity, higher earning, more time spent on teaching, generally in the Anglo-Saxon salary literature, smaller salaries and lower productivity. I would say it's not the case, and this is really perplexing. Previous research indicated strong positive correlation between research hours and salary levels. My research, based on a cross-European sample, does not confirm these findings today. And perhaps that's the reason why Nature had an editorial about, this, about those academic top earners across Europe today. The traditional link between higher type investments in research and higher incomes does not currently seem to hold in continental Europe. This is perplexing. It doesn't hold. Top earners across Europe spend more time on all academic activities except for teaching and research. And they spend more time on administrative and non-commercial service hours, contrary to expectations of half a decade of academic salary studies. This was really perplexing. The third type of certification in higher education, and again, research-based form of certification, is international research certification. Results show that both institutions and individual academics are stratified by international research collaboration, which tends to be correlated with higher research productivity. Results show that internationalists and locals in research emerge as two prototypical figures in higher education. This is one of the most interesting findings in this research. Those who say yes to the question, are you collaborating international in research? And they who say, no, I'm not collaborating international in research, are again different species in higher education. And I call them internationalists and locals in research. They could be termed certainly cosmopolitans and locals on any other perk could be found. My results show that across Europe, some systems, some institutions, institutional types, academic clusters and academics were more internationalized than others in terms of research. And interestingly, international research contributes to increasing stratification of the academic profession. Why is it so? Because it is positively correlated with higher publishing rates. And publishing today determines prestige in terms of access to research funding, in terms of access to promotion, in terms of salaries, under many, many different dimensions. So international research stratifies the academic profession more than, than, than we previously imagined. Just a brief gra graph. I didn't, I didn't know really if it's interesting or not. I, I deleted the slides, the graphs, and then I put them back. Maybe, maybe it's, it's good to say this. Uh, again, patterns and not, and not numbers. You can see, uh, you can see, it, this is a pattern which I did, this is a graph which I did for Poland, but similar patterns are for any of the 11 countries. Lo productivity of locals is 100%. And you can see internationals, those collaborating international, international research, measured by different proxy measures. It's, it's peer-reviewed articles, peer-reviewed article equivalents, uh, peer-reviewed article equivalents in English, etc., etc. Whichever measure you take, you see the pattern. My results show that in all academic clusters, in all 11 countries studied, with no exception, with no exception at all, mean productivity is consistently higher for internationalists. Internationalists across, across Europe produce at least twice as many peer-reviewed article equivalents as locals and three times more article equivalents in English by country. More generally, however, European academics who do not collaborate internationally in research, whom I call locals, but it doesn't matter how I call them, 
may suffer increasing losses today. The losses could be in terms of access to research resources. And they can also be in terms of academic prestige and promotions. This is a crucial point today. The prestige generation through research applies to, to, uh, to academic careers across the whole board of institutional types in all countries. Academic performance certification is linked to research resources certification, which I didn't study today. These are highly funded academics, and it is linked powerfully to academic journal certification. And those academics who, whom I could call elite journal publishing academics, also not studied today and not, not, not presented today. So there are many other certification types just mentioned. I will, I will discuss more in the final slide. We are more heavily divided than, than we expected. Finally, policy implications and, uh, and conclusions. I will have policy implications by, by type of certification separately. So first, policy implications of performance certification. This implies the implications differ by job profile and by institutional type. It, it depends on where we are located as academics. They are different for those pursuing research-oriented careers and those interested predominantly in teaching. They are different for those in research-intensive universities and in teaching-focused institutions. We have to think, I would say, about ourselves in the context of larger processes, especially these strong research-related stratifying forces which are tearing apart the academic profession. However, the policy implications of highly skewed research performance are especially important for young academics. They need to know where, where they want to be. They need to know what to do or what not to do, or what to be trying to be. It's enormously important today once the profession is heavily and more and more stratified. To become a top research performer in Europe, an academic must invest higher than average amount of time in research. It's traditional, we know it. But also, an academic must invest higher than average amounts of time in all other academic activities, including teaching, service, and administration. So it's very, very tough to combine all those missions. At the individual level, there seems to be which I called a permanent struggle between research time and non-research time. And we know it from our lives, research and non-research time. Also between research orientation and teaching orientation. And this is a point when inclusion and excellence come as a topic. There are conflicting dimensions at the individual level. Excellence drives us somewhere else, and inclusion drives us somewhere else. The entry ticket to top performance is as follows. Long research hours, certainly, but also long total working hours. Also high research orientation, and finally, high levels of international collaboration, all combined. That's the entry ticket to high performance. Less research productive academics, the 50%, which are responsible for 8% of all publications, are a significant and untapped research potential across Europe. There's huge potential in each of the countries because in most of them, 8 to 10 percent to 12 percent, the average is 8, is, produce, is, respons is, is responsible, is produced, uh, this productivity of 8 percent of the total is produced by half of academics. And what I'm saying, there's potential which is not used. Then, policy implications of academic salary certification. What we need to remember at the individual level, this is our level, academics with what I term a taste for research, you have to remember, much time in your life will be spent on non-research activities, non-research activities, and we have to live, live with that. Time spent on research activities emerges as a highly stratifying force, however, it's a highly stratifying factor. At institutional and national levels, at the same time, those institutions which are offering more research time will be much more attractive. The contrast of this picture are American universities, which may be much more attractive if they offer more research time available compared to total working time. 
While prestige remains central to the academic enterprise, the influence of salary certification on the future of the academic profession cannot be disregarded. Research cannot be a bonus for weekends and summer breaks, and for many of us, it is, if the profession is to be attractive. Academics need to be a solid part of the middle classes without even hinting at its proletariat, proletarianization, if that's the correct word. In many countries, including the UK and Poland, proletarianization of the academic profession is an issue. Finally, policy implications for international research certification. At the individual level first, the competition for prestige and the competition for research resources hinges increasingly on internationalization in research. Not only research, but internationalization in research. Across Europe, and it's one of the critical points, internationalists compete directly with locals. Those collaborating internationally in research are competing directly with those who are not. The rules governing incentives and rewards are homogeneous. International prestigious publications are a key success factors in all systems studied. At an aggregated European level, the differences between internationalists and locals are consistent across, across all five clusters I studied and can be summed up in a single statement. Quote, no international collaboration in research, no international co-authorship. So, aggregated institutional success hinges on disaggregated individual research successes. According to the prestige maximization model of higher education, in which we are awarded individually for prestige which we are giving to our institutions. Consequently, scholarly publishing is more than an individual matter today. The more funding rules are changing, the more publishing matters in most systems. Scholarly publishing first determines institutional or departmental funding, a big thing. And second, scholarly publishing defines research rich versus research poor units within our universities. So we have a huge segmentation within, with our, within our institutions. I would say even more, employing, employing high publishing academics generates research funding. And employing low publishing academics attracts little or no research funding. We know it in general, but the issue and the tensions go down to the very down level of individual academics. And the final, final policy implication, external research collaboration has powerful internal implications, internal implications. Those who successfully pursue international collaboration become more competitive in their own institutions. They are more powerful with higher leverage vis-a-vis -vis their management teams. That's important also for young academics. Internationalists, as studied in this research, differ fundamentally in their academic attitudes and academic behaviors from locals. They think differently, and we can measure it by cluster, by country, by institutional type. And they work differently, and we just know it. Both internationalists and locals constitute homogeneous groups across European systems. International visibility of national research hinges on prevailing patterns of collaboration and publication. Collaboration can be international, national, or none at all. And publishing can use international channels, national channels, or none at all. And it's not so much powerful in social sciences, but in sciences, natural sciences, life sciences, this is an absolutely crucial point. The publication channels and the collaboration or no collaboration. And finally, conclusions. What is the most single stratifying factor in the higher education enterprise today? It's research. It's research and it's funding most. This is tearing apart the academic profession across Europe. The changing character 
changing volume, changing structure of national research funding powerfully stratify the academic profession today. The underpinning of a certification system in higher education is contribution to knowledge through published research. Success and recognition are inseparable, inseparable from consequential high quality publications. Our large scale comparative quantitative data show increasing tensions in higher education. And I would say most of those tensions are research related. Extending to the individual academic in all systems. I had access to 500 transcripts of interviews from across Europe, and I used a large number of, of interviews in parts of my research, not presented today, and we know about the tensions and about the details of how, how difficult it is to be an academic from those interviews. I'm not referring to this qualitative material, but it's, it is also telling. So there are tensions in higher education. The tensions can be operationalized through the various dimensions of social certification. They can be measured across systems, institutions, age cohorts, gender, etc., etc. It's a hell of work, but it can be done. Academics are at the center of changes in governance and funding regimes and the tensions that ensue. We are in the spotlight, but also we are in the very center of what's going on. In both research-focused institutions and in teaching-focused institutions, these changes filter down to our work and life. We can feel it. There's then ongoing refer, pro pro refer processes, there are ongoing refer processes across Europe. The evolution of our job requirements mirrors the increasing certification of institutions like in, in, in individuals. We see it in our contracts and our job descriptions. And finally, the last set of comments. The three types of certification studied today refer predominantly to research. But it's, not, it's not the end of the story. There are other certification types not discussed at all. Academic power certification, we are divided by academic positions. Academic age certification, by cohorts. Academic role certification, by teaching and research roles assumed. Gender, not even mentioned today. Research funding, we are divided by funding opportunities, which are linked to our locations. Finally, academic journal certification, we are divided by journals in which we are publishing. To sum up, my empirical evidence shows that the academic profession is heavily internally divided, as divided as never before. And possibly it is because it is massified as never before. We are divided, but in turbulent, volatile times, our collective future of the academic profession is at stake. I would say nothing is guaranteed to us today. Nothing is self-evident today. Think of the UK, but think also of Poland. Together we stand, divided we fall. We, the profession, versus the outside world, generally hostile to universities today across Europe. Thank you so much. It was a huge honor to be able to talk to you. Thanks, dear colleagues and friends. Um, I wonder if you could just say whether those patterns were done mainly within countries or between countries. In other words, might there be differences across different countries? And following that, if so, if there are any plans to look at national level policies and the way that affects performance of individual academics, since your analysis focused entirely on individual factors based on your survey, but it would seem that those could be contextualized by, to look at policies in countries and in institutions. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. take several at once. If, oh, you don't, you'd rather yeah, do it once? If you don't mind please do, please do. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Bob. That's a fantastic question. Surprisingly, the patterns are similar across Europe. So they are more a cluster of cluster of cluster of uh, cluster of academic disciplines related rather than country related. So you, you you can you have those top performers across all European systems, and it's always upper ten percent doing fifty percent of publications. You have top earners in most countries. The only exception is Poland with strict, rigid salary systems. There's no correlation at all between publication and, and, and earnings. So overall, 
coming back to the main question, I'm talking about cross-European patterns, even though if you look at the details, there are national variations, but it's, it's, it's a different story. Somehow UK is always separate. Uh, it's really Anglo-Saxons, and most, most stories I'm saying here, uh, I'm using the term continental Europe and continental European systems, but not in terms of top performers. This is the, the common pattern. Mark, I think it's very interesting analysis that you've presented, but would you I mean, say, would you say I, who you are, please? Yes, yeah, so Rose Medine, Royal Holloway. Um, I think there's an issue about where you see this going, because, for example, you said right at the end that you didn't talk about gender. In fact, you did, because you talked a lot about men who are high publishers. And I think the corollary of that is there are a lot of women who are picking up a lot of domestic responsibilities and making it possible for those long hours. I think there's, there's, I mean, there's also a kind of thread in the analysis which kind of says research is the most important thing to universities because it brings in money. But in most European universities, teaching brings in more money than research. So that's something you didn't really look at. And, and I think there's this sort of question, okay, where, where does this go? So yes, higher education is highly stratified. What do we do about it? But I didn't see much in the talk that actually suggested what we can do. And, and this kind of pattern of having these very high performers, um, many of whom are producing articles that go into non-open access or only partial open access journals, yeah. that may well be threatened in the future. So some, I think some of the elements of your analysis don't lend themselves to kind of saying, okay, what do we actually do about it? Yeah, yeah, thank you. That's a great question. The question is what we want. I didn't say it here. We, we, we imagine some future for our university and we need clear answers to ourselves. So I presented the picture as it is. Certainly, I didn't mention gender issues in the speech, though done in many places in my book. Certainly, all these forces are tearing apart the academic profession. And as you said, they are threatening threatening the academic profession, but, but some processes are becoming more and more intensified. Think, for instance, of the stratification by journals in which we are publishing. The top journals are flooded with submissions, and lower-tier journals fight for submissions, fight for manuscripts. So the, I, I'm, what I was saying is that there is intensification of the stratification, and the research is the primary stratifying force. The question is, do we want it? Can we change it? Can we change the rules in our research councils? Can we change the progression into newer rules? Are we able to do this? Do we want this? I mean, it differs from country to country, from institutional type to institutional type, and I don't have a good answer to this. I'm generally in favor of those stratifying forces, because I have a Polish experience in which research for decades were disregarded. So in the Polish context, these stratifying forces work well, while in Europe it may be differently. I would say country-specific answers would work better than this type of European-wide uh, answers. So I didn't even provide European-wide answers, except for suggestions to young academics. If you want something, think carefully, think where you are, think what you're doing or what you're not doing, if you, if you, for instance, want a good academic career. This is a practical answer. I'm not providing maybe ideological, good, large-scale European answers. I don't dare do this. Okay, thank you. We, we've got time for two more, I think. Um, Sorry, we've really got to use the mic. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Sorry. Yes, Emmanuel, uh, my name is Emmanuel from South Africa, Rhodes University. Just two related questions. One, um, I didn't hear uh, when in terms of academics who are highly productive, to what extent are those collaborations, including uh, research in the this, in this South, so North-South kind of research, whether or not you've picked that up, and, and where that research ends up you know, being published, and research between those two, so the North and South, and where that knowledge get published, and what it means in terms of knowledge generation globally, so that, that aspect. The second aspect is you seem to be constructing massification as a problem, 
right? And, 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 and hence, we are where we are now. I just want to hear your views about massification, whether you see it as a problem, and therefore the kinds of problems we're identifying, or in fact, massification enriches knowledge generation across the globe. So just, just those two points. Yes, thank you. There's a huge tension between massification of higher education, I would say which we all love to some extent or to large extent, and the massification of, of the academic profession with its traditional upper middle class or middle class lifestyles and opportunities to do le leisurely research at a leisurely pace in most, most of our universities. So I, I welcome massification and I love it in terms of higher education. And at the same time, I see the threats, and I try to describe them to you today, the threats of having millions of professors and lecturers and people in higher education who probably cannot be as lavishly funded and as with such as good salaries as in the 60s and 70s, before massification came. So I, I see those tensions. The more students mean the more academics, which means much different type of academic work. And those tensions I wanted to raise. Inclusion, yes, excellence, only in some places and only to some extent. It's a huge tension indeed, I fully agree. Yes. 